Hi, everybody. I'm Jamila Lemieux, and welcome to another episode of Color of Change's award-winning series, Tell Black Stories. Tell Black Stories podcast was created as an extension of Color of Change's Hollywood work, where the organization is changing rules in Hollywood by ensuring accurate, diverse, empathetic, and human portrayals of Black people in film, television, and music. So today we're here with the incredible artists and creators behind the Music for the Movement Black History Always EP project. It's the second volume uh, of the project, which is a collaboration between The Undefeated, which is ESPN's content initiative exploring the intersection of sports, race, and culture, and Hollywood records. So today to talk about the project, we have none other than Tinashe, who contributed a stunning cover of I'm Every Woman. We have Momo from Infinity Song, the sibling band that created the uh, piece, the spoken word piece, Undefeated. Ace Rice, the illustrator and artist of the Black History Always um, EP cover. We have Matt, AKA God's Art, the illustrator and artist for the Eden art cover. We have Matthew Dix, the illustrator and artist for the Winter in America art cover, and Christina Martinez, the illustrator for the uh, covers of I'm Every Woman and Wake Up Everybody. Thank you all so much for being here. Uh, thank you for collaborating on this really stunning project. Uh, these are some powerful tunes that have been reimagined. We've got some really dope new work uh, that we're experiencing from exciting young artists. And we've got this really beautiful visual art to accompany it. Black History always reimagines uh, these very significant songs for and by artists that represent Black America. Um, and it shines a light on art as a form of protest and love. I'd love for each of you to share a little bit about your experience of working on this project and what it meant to you, particularly at a time like this. Can we start with you, uh, Sister Tina Shea? Sure. Um, okay, so for me, this was a beautiful project to be a part of. Um, I think last year, especially for me, was a I felt a very important time in our nation in terms of just turning up the volume on Black Lives Matter on a lot of issues that you know need to be discussed even more, um, whether that's diversifying, whether that is you know showing more love to Black artists, Black creatives. I think that that's something that is so important always, and and I love that we're having more and more conversations about that. Um, so to me, it just felt perfect after a year of you know being active and and trying to just spread the message um, that I could continue doing that through art and continue doing that through music and to be a part of this project that I think has, you know, such a thread of, of positivity, inspiration, um, togetherness. I think it's really great to be a part of something like that. So for me, it was a no brainer. I also got to cover a iconic song, I'm Every Woman, um, which is, you know, just, so iconic and such a staple, I think, um, from that era to be able to redo it and kind of bring it into uh, a more modern kind of house approach is, is really exciting for me as well. So yeah, it was a no brainer. I loved being a part. Thank you. Definitely a very fun, uh, very now approach to such a classic, classic record. Uh, Momo, can you talk a little bit about the process that you and your siblings uh, enjoyed while putting together your contribution for this album, for the CP rather? Uh, yeah, um, so we were actually approached kind of last minute and we had no idea about the project and we didn't really have like, I had no idea who else was going to be on the project at all. We were just approached and they were like, can you write something that um, a spoken word piece, actually. So the piece that I wrote was actually a spoken word piece, which is a little bit out of my sphere. I'm a singer and a songwriter. So I usually sing. That's how I usually use my voice. And speaking is not necessarily my strongest suit. But I've studied spoken word in the past when I was in high school. A few, a few years ago, I was obsessed with like slam poetry and spoken word and just 
absolutely obsessed with watching Maya Angelou de uh, deliver her, her poems and things like that. So I thought this was really exciting to actually be able to exercise that like side passion of mine. And so when we were um, approached, I, I had to like write it in like a day. And then, um, so I wrote it and then I came up with um, a, a melody line. I play the guitar as well and the bass. So um, I came up with a melody line and some harmonies and I recorded it um, in Logic right there. It was really just like a really quick turnaround, really quick turnaround. Um, and then I sent a demo to the people and they really loved it. And um, it was honestly an honor to be asked to do that with such a, a wide array of different artists. And um, I, I work with my siblings all the time. We have a band, there's five of us, um, but this was definitely something new, definitely something new and it, it was exciting, yeah. Christina, can you talk a little bit about your process of creating artwork to accompany this project? Did you get to hear the music um, first? Were you told what the themes of the songs would be about and were you responding to that? How did you, uh, let's start with you and I'd love to hear how uh, the three of you all created visuals to accompany Black History Always. Yeah, so for this project, I, um, I'm so, so thankful to be a part of it and was inspired right away, um, you know, to get started on the artwork. I actually got to, my partner, Alba Sear Holly, was a part of the first round. So I kind of got to see him like go through the motions of creating his artwork and um, was familiar with the project and was really excited about the project, just seeing it happen through him. So then being able to be a part of it myself was um, really, really exciting. Um, my approach for both covers was kind of different. With Toby, there was, um, I didn't have as much time to think about it. And so I had to really just like go with my first instinct. Um, and with the words of the song, um, I did get to hear it and, and I got to see his visuals for it uh, before I created it, which really, really helped. And so um, I felt like with the message for this song and the lyrics, it was really, really important for me to keep a reflection of him on the cover and have that message be coming from a strong Black man um, during this time. And so it, that, that one really was, it was just taking the essence of Toby and expressing that and making sure that um, anyone who looked at the cover saw a strong Black presence on it. And then with Tanache, I actually got to talk to her on the phone. And when I think of her, I just think of like color and, and happiness and joy. And so I wanted to create something that was really strong, but also um, very, very simple. And I think when I thought of I'm every woman, my, you know, I paint women all the time. So my mind was kind of going in every direction. And in the end, I felt like the strongest message came from like the repetitive face of like one woman, like we're all, we're all different, but, but together, like we are all the same. And, um, you know, I wanted to create um, a figure that was looking straight at you. And um, I took the energy from her and in the song and I put it together and, that's what, what I came up with. Thank you. Mike, yeah. what about you? Can you tell us a little bit about your process with this project? Yeah, um, funny enough, your mix up. Um, at first, they, the guy, Jathan, approached me. He wanted me to do the Winter in America cover. And then he was like, nah, man, we got this Brent Fias track for you. And I'm like, cool, I listened to Brent. Uh, since he Sonder Day, so I'm familiar with his art. Um, and he kind of gave me a briefing of the song and kind of the what he was extracting from it. Um, and then I did like two minutes into like reading his email and he had sent me the song. I didn't even listen to the song. I'm like, I sent him some pre-existing art that I did. Um, one piece that I had that was already named Eden, that was about, uh, that was a biblical painting. 
and another painting that was um, the Lady of Guadalupe, like in this like flower stylistic you know, form that I use. Um, and he was like, oh man, I don't know. You just had that sitting around, that's perfect. And I'm like, yeah, I know. Um, Cause I just, I know Brent's music. I know his sentiment. I know like the feeling of it and the spirit of it. So once I read two sentences, I was like, oh, this is the direction. Um, and he was like, I don't know how you're gonna like interpolate that into a new piece. But what I ended up doing was using uh, the DNA of like two pre-existing paintings um, and kind of uh, creating something new and creating like this silhouette silhouette from from Brent. So that's uh, that's actually like Brent's head and his facial features on the person that's kneeling down. Um, and yeah, it's just kind of like replacing like the Lady of Guadalupe with this black man kneeling, praying, um, kind of just highlighting the, I mean, the lyric that kind of like propelled it into the, the direction for me was like, ain't no policing until my knees met. So it's like, for me, that was like two meanings where it's like police kind of like being a black man that's, you know, I've been arrested. Like I, I thought about this yesterday, like I've been in that position like five, six times. <laughs> So, so they're not like equipped to do, or they don't feel comfortable doing their job with you until like they have you on your knees and in cuffs. But then also I thought about just like the surrendering to God and you, he can't do what he needs to do for you until you surrender to him. And that is a part of, a part of that is like humbling yourself and getting down on your knees, which, um, you know, last year, I know like the socio and like economic component of last year is big, but for me, it was like a spiritual, a big spiritual component. So that resonated with me a lot. And uh, it was a great curation from the Disney side or the ESPN side to pair me with that song. Definitely a very powerful image uh, for a powerful song. Thank you for sharing that, Mike. What about you, Matthew? Yeah, I had the Winter America piece. Um, again, it's a privilege to work on it. Uh, it sounds like a great project to be on with Freddie Gibbs, an artist that I follow. We're actually from the same hometown. So when he told me it was a project that he was doing, I was like, absolutely, I'm on board. Um, the piece specifically is, uh, I had to try to uh, put together all the visual vivid imagery that Jill Scott Heron has in his piece. He makes a lot of metaphors towards the uh, direction that America has gone in since, you know, its original sin with the Native American genocide and going on through like uh, this dystopia kind of vision of America being kind of um, hard to be optimistic in times of struggle and oppression. So I really just want to have an image that kind of was our version of the Statue of Liberty, the black version of the Statue of Liberty with a female, strong female presence and um, actually being an empowerment of equality and liberty and justice, because I believe that's the underlying tone um, of his piece. Uh, There's a lot of visual imagery that I could have just, you know, plucked from verbatim um, for the album cover art, but I think just focusing on one solid image to um, try to encompass everything that he's talking about in the piece uh, was the direction to go in. And, you know, I'm a fan of like Francis Bacon's art when he tried to paint the popes and using the screams from from um, different videos of European history and George Kondo as well, just to incorporate kind of like the psychological um, weight that we have in the African-American community for dealing with these systems of oppression. Um, so just, just trying to put together everything into one solid piece. Um, I, and I believe it worked as well. It's, it's a striking image that um, I'm excited to hear the final piece that Freddie Gibbs puts on it. Awesome. Thank you, Matthew. Uh, last and certainly not least, Ace, can you talk about uh, putting together the image that would tie 
all of this beautiful artwork together uh, and make the EP cover for Black History Always. First of all, thank God for having me. This is pretty amazing. Like, uh, it's a pleasure to be on the panel with uh, such dope um, talent uh, and amazing artists. I follow a bunch of y'all already. So, um, I, I one, I wanted to just like uphold what I thought would be a certain standard of like creative that like the leading black talent would put out. And I knew that um, kind of from what Jason had told me about the project um, and what I saw with the first uh, EP. Um, that he, you know, it was going to be an incredible group of not only like visual talent, but also like music talent. So I just wanted to try and put my best foot forward um, amongst the black artists um, that were going to be involved, first of all. Um, but then that, that in context of like being a creative um, in the midst of commercialization of your art too. So this was kind of a, a, a process for me. So uh, in that as well. So uh, I think as an artist, I've uh, explored mostly just creating art from my own visual, from my own from my own heart. And so this was a little different working with kind of a, 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 a chance where I, it was bringing art together that was a collection of many songs. So I was able to hear three or three or of the four songs in advance of creating the artwork. And uh, I tried to just put my own perspective into it. I think uh, one, uh, I'm from South Minneapolis. I'm from like the corner where George Floyd died, like the corner store where George Floyd died. I'm from like that block. I've been to that store a thousand times. Like I saw one to one represent my community when it came to that and know that we've been through a lot. And we're really uh, particular when it comes to the commercialization of the movement and the struggle. Like I don't want to just paint this picture that's uh, a repetitive narrative um, where it's like us against them or like we're this struggle league, we're the um, sufferer always. So I think mostly I wanted to make sure it didn't feel like we were like the sufferer in this movement, but more so bring like a positive energy and a, 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 a optimistic um, approach to the artwork. So that was kind of my, my biggest approach. And then like, there were some ideas around uh, what this message should feel like. And so one of the ideas was um, kind of like that, that rose that grows from the concrete or like this, uh, you know, we've seen the worst of times, but now we're going to see the best of times. And I, and I really just, as an artist, I kind of struggle with that because I honestly wanted to stay away from that and, and not so much acknowledge our oppressing forces and just only acknowledge our, our blessing and our, and our own, within, within our own community, our own like light that we could share. I didn't want to kind of, um, you know, the, the rose that grew from concrete, I think that sometimes could be like, that's like a myth to me. Like roses don't grow from concrete, roses grow from water and good soil and being nurtured and giving good sunlight and et cetera. And so I don't want to push the narrative like we can be oppressed and we can still push through. No, that comes with a lot of scars and baggage and stuff like that. So I just really try to stay away from that narrative and more than anything, give something that feels like uh, a blessing or some type of good positive energy. And then just kind of with the different colors, I want to feel like if you want to take like a more, I guess, narrow approach to the conversation, uh, just I want to give the, the, the person of color multiple colors too, because I think within our own community, there's conversations that we have about like blackness and uh, just, you know, I could kind of expound on that amongst the ADOS movement and stuff like that. But like, you know, at the end of the day, I think that's more destructive to the conversation and that I wanted something where everybody could feel from a contextual uh, com you know, uh, tone and melanin piece, like that they're all with, we're all within this color of whoever this person is and that feeling. So that's kind of a, a, a very narrow perspective on the art, but the, the, the overall vision that was really kind of my, my goal. Awesome, thank you. Uh, thank you, Ace, and, and truly a, a beautiful image that you created. Uh, so there, there are a few songs on this uh, project that are covers and the messages, the symbolism, the power of songs like Winter in America and I'm Every Woman are just as relevant today as when they were first recorded. Um, to go back to you, Tina Shea, like talk about, I mean, what a big record, right? I'm Every Woman. This is a song, you know, created for and by Shaka Khan 
that gets a new life through Whitney Houston in 1992. So it's a song that certainly has been with you for, you know, most of your life, all of your life, really. Um, it's a song that belongs to generations of, of Black women and means something really special to us. Can you talk about what it meant for you to be re revisiting that particular song uh, yeah. and paying homage to those artists and that message? Yeah, I mean, that song, like I said before, is just truly so iconic. I feel like everyone knows that song. Every woman knows that song. And for me, just having a celebration of, of womanhood and Black womanhood, I think is so important. Like, we should be celebrating ourselves every day. And so to, I mean, for me, it was really important this last year that I created music that elevates us um, spiritually or vibrationally to that next level. So everything that I've created, even my own um, work, the stuff that I've been writing, everything feels very uplifting and energizing and inspiring. And this song is so uplifting and so energizing. It's just like a fun, fun song. Um, so for me, that this, it just made sense. And then on top of it, like you mentioned, the fact that it was has been performed and created by such iconic entertainers. Shaka Khan is a legend and Whitney Houston is a legend. And to even be in any type of same conversation as those legends is a huge honor, tremendous, tremendous honor to even touch the song and put my own take spin on it. Um, so yeah, being a part of, of that is, is, is amazing. It feels really great. I have a question that I want to put to the entire group. Do you all feel, and this is something that's been asked many times in many different ways, uh, and, and is constantly debated, particularly in our community. Do you feel that artists have a responsibility to um, raise awareness about issues of injustice and oppression in their work? Some would say yes, because if you have a platform, you should be using it to do good for your people. Other people would say, just because you're an artist doesn't necessarily mean that you're quick to talk about these things or that you have strong or, or even clear views about them. Um, I'd be curious to hear from you all. I'd like to start with you, Momo. What sort of responsibility do you think artists have um, to, to use their art to do good or do they have a responsibility at all? Um, I personally definitely believe that there is a certain responsibility that we as artists have. I do wanna to go to the point that you, that you um, mentioned that not all artists are necessarily equipped to speak on these things, you know, a lot of times we exalt artists as the leaders of the community when a lot of times people are not educated. Um, even myself, I'm not completely educated on all, um, on all, in all areas. There's a lot of things that I still have to learn, you know, a lot of things that still have yet to be learned. Whereas there are people who, you know, spend their life studying these topics. That's what they do. And so for us to put such a burden and put such a, not a burden, but such a huge responsibility and give such an important role to people who are not, that's not necessarily their forte. That's where a lot of the, the disappointment sometimes comes from. I remember, I remember um, scrolling on Twitter when all of the George Floyd things, not the George Floyd things, when the um, protests were happening, when George Floyd was killed and there was just an uproar about artists misspeaking and rightfully so, but it's because we, and there was also a clip of, I believe Malcolm X speaking and saying that we cannot give these artists our lives. We cannot expect them to deliver us. We cannot expect them to lead us to the promised land. That's not, they you know, a lot of times that's not you know, they weren't, they weren't trained for that. That's not what they're here for. We need to raise up other leaders who, ha who feel that burden. And, but at the same time, with all of that being said, I still do believe if you do have a platform and you do have a voice and you do have influence and you do have people's ear, then absolutely, you know, get as much education as you can in order to, you know, 
be able to influence and impact and actually, you know, make a difference. Um, me personally, I agree with what Ace was saying earlier about how um, a lot of times the narrative can be too focused on the rose from the concrete about us persevering through the struggle and it's just been so hard and it has obviously, but when you get so um, bogged down in that, it can be hard to see the sunlight. It can be hard to actually persevere. It can be really hard. So I personally, when I create, when I write music, when I sing, I like to focus on, yes, there's hardships, but we can and we are and we will be something more than those hardships, you know? So um, me personally, I, I, I use my protest in that way, living in a positive way uh, um, and creating music in a positive way, not necessarily in every song talking about the struggle, you know, because there's more to being black than struggle there's joy, there's community, there's wholeness, there's a wide array of things that goes into being black, you know, just being, just being a human, just, you know, living, just walking your day to day, like that's all a part of being black. Not everything is about struggle. It's about creating, uh, um, visualizing the entire a uh, well-rounded experience of being black. So I like to, you know, play on different things. So yeah, that's what I have to say. You know, Shay, I wanna bring this back to you because uh, I, I argue that musicians more than any other group of artists are faced with this particular uh, demand from their audience to be outspoken about issues related to social justice um, and that black artists in particular uh, are faced with this expectation more than others are. How do you respond to that? Do you feel that it is a duty and a responsibility or is it simply a choice that artists can exercise? I think for me personally, it doesn't feel like a choice. It feels like my duty as a, just a human being in general. I think that that's where the disconnect doesn't um, can sometimes happen is when people put their careers or their art above what they stand for as a human being. And if that isn't true for you, then maybe you don't speak that truth. But for me, being able to, you know, say what I feel about all of these social justice movements and like have an opinion and put it on social media and share my perspective has been really important just as a human existing. Um, but then I, I think uh, there was a really good point made in terms of like in the art itself, I do think that there are ways to um, share that excitement, that, that higher vibration, that energy level to make it not necessarily literal in the music and, and in the art, because I personally, uh, sometimes don't want to listen to music that just feels like a like it reflects the struggle or like it has this energy of negativity to it. Sometimes I just want to be free and be happy. So it's interesting. I think that you can certainly um, be an activist through your music without having to be literal um, about it. I think that you can share themes that inspire people. I think that you can even even just by creating music that people want to dance to, even if not everything in the music is 100% politically correct, but it makes people come together. That's the thing about music. It brings people together. It brings joy. It brings happiness out of community. So I think that when communities create art that makes them feel good or excited, um, no matter what the particular, particular subject matter is, I do think that that in and of itself is important. And, um, yeah, so I think that there's ways, like I said, to to be able to share your own form of protest or your own um, form of giving back to the community without having to be super literal about it. Thank you. Um, Ace, it, it seems like it may be the case that for visual artists and you, uh, you four would know better than me, 
that you get a little bit more space to choose if I'm going to engage with political work, is my work going to be political? Perhaps that, that's how it is for you all, or maybe it, it, it's not. And there's that same pressure there. Uh, but thinking of what you said about not wanting to necessarily add to the idea of the roads that grew from concrete and instead um, wanting to depict uh, a different image or different images of black life. Can you talk a little bit about what um, role responsibility and, and black storytelling play for you? Is this something that you are called to do or something that you, you feel that you must do or just something that you take uh, joy in doing in um, reflecting our lives in, in this particular yeah. way in your work? Yeah. Yeah, I think one, I don't like to your earlier question um, that you posed, I don't think every artist has to be political in their work or has to like stamp or something in their work. But I think that's what makes certain artists special. You know, I think that's what made like Muhammad Ali special, right? Like he, he was willing to risk it all for something. But I don't think every boxer needed to be up on a soapbox trying to push his own political agenda. So I just think that makes artists special. So um, to your second question, I think, um, I think it's important for me. It's important. I grew up like very much. My parents, my, 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 you've seen the name my mom gave me. She was very in tune with like, you know, that very Pan-Africanism since the 80s, um, coming out of Brooklyn and moving to Minnesota. Um, so I grew up with two very strong and, and, and parents when it came to that. Um, and then like my dad was a music manager. So I grew up with basically like Prince was like an uncle to me when I was a kid. So, you know, I, I think there was a, in, in context of this conversation, like, being around somebody who wrote slow slave on their face when they was on stage and like that's like my old head you know what i'm saying so it's like i've always been more conscious of again like the commercialization of art like you know that you could you could do things certain ways for more commercial commercial success or you could stay true and, and just have faith and belief with god and you know rock your own path so um i can't really separate it because that's not how I grew. I was literally named after Asa Philip Randolph, who is who's a family friend of my great grandfather. Asa Philip Randolph was Martin Luther King's mentor. So it's like I come from a lineage of like you know, you know the real stuff. So I I have I have to do it, but I also do believe doing it in ways that are commercially acceptable for 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 the other people that are uh of, you know black. So like I I think I I have my own brand that sells my art, and you know I, I have like a Martin Luther King hat that I sell and probably 50% of the people that buy my Martin Luther King hat are white people. And so I think there's like a, I think, and I love being able to present a, a, a statement, but still making it a way to cross over to where it's not, you know, only for us, by us type of thing. It's, it's you know, from us, but for everybody's consumption. Um, and that's kind of always been my motto. So um, maybe that, you know, it, I just think that's like being creative and how you take your stand is really, um, more important than it for, for each person, how they want to, you know, live out their, who they are um, is more important than anything. Mike, can you talk a little bit about that intersection of selling your art and having a message to your art and, and how they work together or perhaps sometimes maybe are in conflict, um, you know, creating something that is about your people or inspired by your people or uh, that, that may have a political message, but also this being something that is sold and, and how that has functioned in your own career. Um. I mean, I come from a, I'm a fine artist, but I also come from a commercial background. So I started, before I was painting, I was doing graphic design. So, um, which is, you know, I took that more for like the immediacy of like communication arts and how that bridges fine art. But um, it's something that I had to grapple with early on um, just from a, this is different because, you know, this project is they tapped individual artists for them. But, you know, earlier in my career, you know, it's kind of just you're doing things based on your skill set that might not reflect like your personal ideals or uh, beliefs. It's just for a client um, and you're trying to get paid for it um, or establish yourself as a designer or as an artist. So um those you know that's a very those are choppy waters 
um, you know, kind of like maturing into it. I don't do anything that I don't believe in, you know, because I know that I just have the choice not to. And like Ace was saying, this is, I'm coming from a perspective of just, you know, what I feel is like my path and what's true for my art and like my purpose and like trusting that everything will fall into place from there. Um, and then I definitely believe, you know, it's just, you have to stand for something or, you know, like the cliche you, or you will fall for anything. <laughs> so like, um, but I do think there's, you know, kind of like this misconception or like this misrepresentation of like expectation that um, comes with um, doing political art or taking a political stance. And um, I'm more of a, I'm not a reactive person. So I like to, you know, look at what's going on and then like, it takes me time to resolve that within myself. Um, so there are people that everybody can't be on the front line. Like there's, there's just as much work going on behind the doors as it is, you know, outside, you know? So I think sometimes people in the public, um, forget about that. Um, and everybody isn't vocal about the actual work that they're doing. <laughs> um, and that's not, that's not an issue either. Um, but I think it's been like sensationalized that everything, if you're doing something, it has to be publicized. And if you're not, and if it's not publicized, you're not doing anything. And I think that's not true. Um, so I think, you know, like Momo was saying, it's about the full spectrum of the work um, and the people that are doing the work. And, you know, it's yin and yang, it's light and dark. So it's people working in the dark and there's people working in the light. And most of the work that has oppressed us has been, you know, work that's been done in the dark. <laughs> so I, I believe, you know, I'm kind of like more on some like art of war, like tactical, but, you know, I just believe that everyone should just play their part. I think um, everyone figuring out what their part is in the movement, however you defend it, uh, excuse me, however you define it uh, and, and playing that part is important. Christina, I, I'd like to hear from you, what has playing your part looked like in, in terms of that intersection of art and activism or art and social justice uh, and storytelling that raises certain issues or concerns? Um, I think, like some of you have said, I mean, you guys have all made like super, super strong points that I could definitely relate to. Um, you know, I'm black and Mexican, but was like fully raised by the Mexican side of my family. And so for me, my, my experience as a black woman is just, that's been my biggest source of like education is just moving through the world and like learning about myself and my identity. And so I think that you know, like Momo said, when you put artists like on the front line, you don't know their perspective. And so for me, my perspective is like educating myself constantly, constantly. You know, my mom, she's full Mexican, had me at 15 years old. And so I, I didn't learn my black, my blackness from my mom. I, I had to learn it just through moving through life. And, you know, I've made it my responsibility to continue to educate myself more. And I think that, you know, like Mike said, a lot of the work has to be done on the inside in order for you to have a voice and for the, then for you to put that voice out into the world and, and stand in it strong, strongly um, because we do influence people. That's, that's the reality of it through our work. Um, and so I try not to, um, I try not to, to think about it to the point where it, it causes me to move in a direction that isn't true to my own story. 
um, I, I do take the experiences of, of myself and the people around me and I, I put those into my art. I think that as an artist um, and being so emotionally connected to so many things, it almost seems impossible to, to make work and not have it reflect what's going on around you. Um, but sometimes activism might look like you know, continuing to create, knowing that you face bigger challenges than the, some of the people around you. You know, sometimes it looks like self-care and self-love. And um, like Tanache said, sometimes it's just pure joy and, and putting that out there in the midst of like chaos and so much suffering. I think that if you acknowledge it within yourself and understand what is happening, um, then the way that you speak on it is, you know, it might not look the way that other people want it to, um, but just having that urgency to, to move in a progressive direction through your work is, is what's most important. Uh, Matthew, I wanna close this question out with you. What does that urgency look like in your artwork? Um, are there particular, uh, when it comes to using your art as a way to respond to things that are going on in the world, um, where does your sense of urgency come from? Is it what you are most directly affected by? Is it from the things that you're consuming in the news? Um, how do you decide uh, to what exactly you're responding in the first place? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think it is the most paramount responsibility for the artist is to just first submit to your artwork. And whatever comes out of that is just what you have to accept. So your work can be autobiographical. And if on a daily basis, you're facing, you know, systemic racism and oppression that by nature would just kind of flourish out of you and come out of you just by default. So I don't think artists really has a lot of control. And I don't think an artist should necessarily try to control what they produce on canvas or on a track or on CD. It's just kind of accepting that submission and being that filter for the interactions that you have in your life and you're able to present that gift to the world of, you know, this is what's going on. I believe it was James Baldwin that said, an artist, a good artist is like a good lover. They show you who you really are. So as artists, we act as a mirror holding up to society and showing this is a reflection of what's really going on. It's kind of out of our control. Like when I'm painting, I have no idea what the end result will look like. I kind of have to post rationalize after something comes up on canvas, like, oh, that's kind of what I was saying. And then that's like my logic coming into play um, and seeing what was I going through during this time. It's, it's not totally calculated from the beginning. It's just, again, that just submission, like Mike was saying, through like meditation. Meditation helped me a lot through just, you know, focusing on how as a black man, I can convey my message best to the youth and best to the public and also be commercially viable. But again, commercialism isn't really my main priority. It's a, a benefit of what I want to sell my artwork and sell my, you know, my clothing and all that kind of stuff, but it's not the priority in creating the work. I just have to accept whatever comes and yeah, it, it just goes to that submission and being willing to accept whatever shows up. Matthew mentioned James Baldwin. Uh, I'd love for each of you all to briefly share an artist that has inspired you in terms of how you view uh, our continued struggle for freedom and liberation and what uh, freedom and liberation might look like for us. Uh, Ace, I, I would imagine that Prince would be one of those artists for you. Yeah. Um, Prince definitely, um, I don't know, there's so many, you probably have to come back to me. I feel like I, I owe you something better than that one, but I got to think about it. That's a good question. Okay, let, we'll let you think about it. Uh, Momo, who do you want to give flowers to? Uh, if you want to name an artist or a couple of artists that have inspired you. Um, I have, I have a lot. To be honest, there are really a lot. The ones, okay, so there's like two different types. So I have a family full of artists, my entire family. There are nine kids in my family. Um, my parents had nine kids and um, um, all of them are artistic. And um, I'm like, I'm the seventh. So all of my older siblings have inspired me tremendously, like beyond, like I can't even speak how much they've inspired me. 
But um, more than them is my dad. He's an artist, he's a visual artist and he's a musician. And he started um, lots of community choirs, the Boys and Girls Choirs of Detroit. When we lived in Detroit, um, he was a community leader. Um, he's ever since he was younger before, way before I was born, he's had the same vision, the same goal, the same drive ever since then to now 30 years later, 35 years later, nothing has changed. The most amazing example of steadfastness, consistency, not letting anything slow him down, not letting, you know, the, uh, the struggles and um, the oppression, not letting any of that deter him, not letting it stop him from, from um, passing those same ideals to his children. I am literally like a sponge when it comes to everything that my dad talks about. He like, I can't even, so I would say first things before anybody else, first person to be like that artist for me is my dad. Like he is that artist. Um, and then in like the, you know, in the music industry, I would have to say, I would have to say Nina Simone as um, as the artist for me. I used to study her a lot, and I still study her a lot. Just her, her that passion she had, that fire. She anything she had to say, she was going to say it, and nobody was going to stop her from saying it. And that is what I really, really admire. Um, sometimes I have a hard time saying exactly what I need to say, or I get nervous, or I, I have anxiety, or I worry too much about what people may think, or you know, just really getting in my head a lot. So studying her, watching her freedom on stage, off stage, just wherever she is, that's so inspiring to me as an artist and it just leaves really like a big um, mark on me and, and it gives me something to really aspire to be in that sense. With, you know, on, with her music and in interviews, it didn't matter where she was, she was gonna say what she had to say. So, you know, I like that. <laughs> very, very outspoken Miss Nina Simone. If you've never yeah. read her autobiography, I strongly recommend it. Uh, she definitely spoke her mind. Mike, uh, can you share with us an artist or two that has inspired you in terms of how you uh, think about freedom fighting and liberation? Um, I think for the sake of this conversation, in probably any conversation, I would have to say um, Jack Whitten, who's a um, he's a black abstract painter. Um, he worked through the '60s all the way up to the 2018. But um, so you know, just in terms of like what kind of like black art looked like then and what it looked like now, and kind of like the expectations of what the representation of like black art and the black intellect was supposed to look like for him to like work in abstract and you know he what a lot of abstract black abstract artists got a lot of like flack and pushback you know uh even from like you know institutions like the studio museum of harlem which is you know an institution where that supports and catalyzes black artists but you know in the 60s, 70s would turn away artists working in, black artists working in abstraction and say I'm like, get that white art out of here. So just in terms of, you know, like what, you know, the in terms of like the full spectrum context and like, you know, it, everyone doesn't have to like look the same or like activism and political activism and your stance doesn't have to like look the same as other people and um, sometimes, like for me, you know, he represents just like evolution and like progression. And sometimes that, you know, you need to take a stance like that, even when your people go against you um, to, to advance the, the full narrative and the, the art form and minds and you know, so, I mean, when you were talking, I don't know, that's the only artist that came to mind. Um, but Jack Whitten, he's, he's the GOAT. Thank you. Um, 
Tina Shea, Mike uh, raised a really interesting point about nonconformity in Black art, right, and, and liberation. And so sometimes it's a matter of singing a song about getting free, and at other times it, it's seeing a Black artist be free that, that gives us the ability to be freer ourselves, right? Can you talk about uh, an artist or two that has inspired you to be your free black self and to create the sort of music that you wish to create as opposed to perhaps what uh, the quote unquote, the industry might prescribe for black women uh, artists to create? Um, my favorite and my like idol has always been Janet Jackson because I think she embodies everything that a black pop star is. Um, she, her music doesn't fit into one particular box. It doesn't sound, R&B all the time. She can make um, music that's just, you know, rivals the, the pop girls of the era, as well as stuff that feels, um, you know, she can genre hop and it makes sense on the same project. Um, visually, she was always like giving you superstar, whether it's performance, whether it was her look, fashion, uh, live show. So for me, that's always been, um, you know, my like top tier, wh who I would like to be or how I would like to see myself as an artist. I think she didn't ever limit herself to maybe some of the genres or categories that uh, people try to place on black female artists. And so, yeah, Miss Janet. <laughs> Miss Janet, and also someone who used her, her music and her platform to advocate for racial equality. Really? stand up for women, stand up for LGBTQ people. Uh, just Absolutely. a really powerful, powerful pop star. Uh, Christina and, and then Matthew and then Ace, we're gonna come back to you really quickly. And then we've got a couple of very special guests uh, who have questions to ask. So I wanna make sure that we get to them before we wrap up. Um, I think that again, staying true to uh, my upbringing and my experience, my first memory of uh, being exposed to a female painter, female artist was Frida Kahlo growing up in a Mexican family. And what I took from her that I have um, applied to my art and, and used in my experience as like a black woman in the world is just taking all of your challenges and using your work to push through them. And, um, and also just recognizing that there was a lack of, of people that looked like me doing what I dreamed of doing. And um, I've kind of made it my mission to highlight as many black and brown stories and experiences as I can through my work because of that. Um, and then outside of that, like I'm blessed to be surrounded by creatives all the time. My kids are creative, my partner is creative. And, I think just, uh, you know, taking in the freedom that my kids create with and the perseverance that my partner creates with. And, um, you know, I'm really just more inspired by the, the people that are around me and, and other creatives that I see pushing through their challenges every day. And I'll go, uh, yeah, one of my main influences, like Momo was saying, Nina Simone, just her equating um, freedom with being no fear just left a profound impact on me. But um, as far as contemporaries, I mean, Virgil Abloh, the work that he did with his figures of speech um, exhibition I saw in Chicago, pretty much changed my life to see that you can create those juxtapositions with your history of being African-American with um, capitalism and having a critique on that. Um, Jean-Michel Basquiat with Irony of a Negro Policeman, um, Pablo Picasso with Guernica. It's, it's a lot of influences that I get on a daily basis um, from a lot of different sources, but um, Banksy as well is always some kind of underlying socially political commentary that he has on his work, you know, influencing that with graffiti and the whole historical context of that being like the political, oh, sorry, the illegal voice of the people that the establishment doesn't want to hear. Um, I'm a big proponent of that and just always trying to get your work out to, you know, fight for the little person, you know, fight for the little guy and to show that we do have power in our voice and that art is powerful. Um, yeah, that's, that's a few of my influences. Thank you. And finally, back to you, Brother Ace. Uh, yeah, I appreciate it. Um, I would definitely say, like, growing up, my, one of my biggest influences was an artist, a local visual artist named 
Minnesota. He's like a, a godfather to me. His name is Say Two Jones. He's a sculptor and painter. He does like a lot of like uh, work around the city as far as uh, city commissioned art, like throughout the neighbor all, all Minneapolis and St. Paul. So that probably he had a huge influence on me. Um, I, I, my uncle was a jazz musician by the name of Lester Bowie. And he was a, like one of the uh, more pioneering like uh, trumpet painters on the avant-garde side. So he's somebody who always like, I, I watched him just break all the rules with his jazz. And there was like no rules. Like he just played all crazy. There was like tempo sometimes like just wow. So he kind of let me know that there's really no rules to the art and just do your thing. Um, and then like most recently, I'm kind of just like, I saw one night in Miami and I was just sleep on Sam Cooke. So like I super recently just dove into Sam Cooke crazy. And I just went on a Sam Cooke binge and it was just, I think that, that story is so interesting because in the movie, obviously I don't know how much of it is real, but just like um, them putting the pressure on him to really try and like speak up and, you know, at a time that was critical when he had been so commercially successful and he was like, no, I'm still down. Like just because I'm winning over here don't mean I'm not down. Uh, and then to go on and write such an, like one of the most iconic like struggle songs of all time for sure. Um, um, I think his whole story was uh, just crazy. So I've been doing my research on his life and understanding like how he came from such a soulful background and, and then which led me into like uh, Baptist, like uh, conservative Baptist music, which is amazing. So like Sam Cooke kind of introduced me into this whole new journey back into like our roots of like music as it came straight off of the plantation. So Sam Cooke's probably one of my, right now, my, one of my biggest inspirations. A great one. I think um, a lot of us who were, you know, too young to have been around when Sam Cooke was alive didn't know um, much about his activism until the documentary that came out a couple years ago, The Two Killings of Sam Cooke, and now um, getting to see him again in uh, A Night in Miami is, is just another reason to go out and uh, do our research and, and to find out more about that incredible artist who did what all of you all have done with this beautiful project and used his work to uh, to raise um, awareness and to uh, to fight for our freedom, to speak our, our freedom uh, and, and our truth on wax. And uh, we're so grateful that you all did that and, and that you created artwork to accompany this beautiful music, that you created beautiful music, that you reimagined music that we'd already loved in new ways that we'll love. Um, and before we get out of here, we've got two questions from HBCU students. The first one is for Tina Shea, and it's from Diana Abdel Gadir, uh, a student attending the Florida A&M University. Greetings, my name is Diana abdel Gadir, and I attend the Florida A&M University. My question is for Tanache. With Women's History Month approaching in March, how important was it for you to recreate your own version of I'm Every Woman? And what does that mean for you in a male-dominated industry? Great question. It is perfect timing with Women's History Month coming right up that I'm releasing this cover. Um, like I said earlier, being a black woman, I think is just another layer of, you know, identity that for me is so important that I just want to celebrate and bring to my art. And especially she hit the nail on the head. This industry is incredibly male dominated. The music industry has not been an easy one to navigate, especially now that I'm an independent artist. Um, you just see how much of a discrepancy there is between the support that you know, men get or the collaborations between male artists, male producers, male engineers. It's just, it's, it's overwhelming. So I think just being a part of that conversation in terms of celebrating what it means to be a woman, not trying to limit ourselves in terms of, yes, we have and can bring so many beautiful things to the table, but what makes us special is still, you know, what makes us truly special, which is just the, the pure essence of, of womanhood, femininity, um, just those extra traits that I think um, the song really touches on and celebrates, whether it be our intuition or being so in touch with our emotions and how those are strengths, not weaknesses, superpowers, and not, um, you know, something that we should push to the side. I think living in my femininity has been very important for me in the male-dominated industry because 
yeah, it's, it's easy to always be in competitive male energy, trying to squash that and trying to out, outdo your, your counterpart. So for me, it's, it's nice to just be. So yeah, great question. Loved it. <laughs> thank you. And thank you for your question, Deanna. Okay, we've got our final question. It is for the entire panel and it's from Naki Franklin, a student at North Carolina a and University. Hi, my name is Naki Franklin and I'm representing North Carolina Agricultural and Technical State University. My question is, do you believe Black people are able to reach their full potential in the music industry? And what changes need to be made in order for Black people to reach their full potential in the music industry? Thank you. Is that for me as well? Question. Yes. Let's can, you, can, you, oh, can you repeat the question? She I'm asked. Sorry. Um, and I'm going to bend it just a little bit to, to bring those of you all who aren't musicians in, but she asked, you know, can Black people reach their full potential in the music industry? And so I will amend that uh, for those of you that are not musicians and ask, do you feel that you can reach your full artistic potential uh, considering uh, the things that we have working against us? in our respective artistic fields, as well as in the world around us. So if we can start uh, back with you, Tina Shea, because you immediately unmuted. She was like, I got an answer for this one. <laughs> well, I felt like, it, I, well, I won't say, but um, I think my career has kind of reflected that or a lot of the things that I talk about has really reflected that because I've spoken a lot recently about um, just how I feel like there is kind of this unspoken box that or like a limited zone that we keep our black artists in especially um black artists that do pop music i think we always kind of expect and genres initially were created i think in my opinion to reflect these racial differences when it started with radio stations kind of putting the black music on one and and the white music on another we created these like r&b and pop categories and and how those still affect our artists today um, when it comes to making art, we start to kind of get brainwashed into thinking that we have to fit into these categories or these boxes. So I have noticed um, that sometimes I feel that in the R&B or the urban space, you don't feel like you're given the same opportunities as the white acts or the acts that are in the, the, the mainstream pop music top 40 radio main playlist on the streaming services. There's just a separation that is, you know, we can't really act like it doesn't exist. But I don't like to think of it negatively in terms of do I think that I'll never be able to break out of those categories. I just like to have hope and just create music for me at the end of the day and hope again that like God, the universe guides me in the direction that I'm meant to take and, and everything will, will go according to that master plan. But yeah, I do think that there are a lot of barriers that we still are working to break down for sure. Thank you. What about you, Momo? Uh, do you feel that you have the ability, you and your family, to reach your full artistic potential, um, it, considering the the current state of the world and the state of the music business? Um, or are those not factors? Are you going to reach your full potential if you were meant to reach your full potential? Um, it is a tricky question because a lot of people have great destinies and, you know, their trajectories have been super, like it's been, you know, super high, but there have been forces within the music industry. There are forces that stamp out lights. There are forces that halt careers, that end careers because of these different factors of how you look or you don't have a certain commercially viable um, sound. And uh, for our, for my family, it has been a struggle because we, um, we have a different type of sound. We're not what people, like when you look at us, you don't expect what you hear a lot of times. So, and that is confusing for people. And sometimes the people who are in charge of marketing us 
you know, when we were first dropping our project, they didn't know how to market us. They said, uh, you guys are an anomaly. We don't know what to do with you. And so we kind of had to take it into our own hands and figure out different ways to push ourselves and to promote ourselves in a way because only we know who we are and only we know what we can offer and, you know, the beauty and the difference in who we are. You know, we, we're not like anybody else and only we are familiar with the best way to communicate that to the world. So we realized if we want to really stay authentic and not you know, go and try to be somebody that we're not so it's easier for them to market us, we have to take it into our own hands. So it is very, very difficult, very, very difficult, I believe. And we're only, you know, in terms of industry, we're just now beginning. So I can only imagine someone like Tanache, like how how hard that has been for you throughout your career. So I, I can only imagine, but moving forward in our careers, that's like the biggest thing that we're going to try to always do is stay true and do the best that we can do for ourselves and let anything, anything that the labels and the big guys and the machines, let that be like an accent. Like, yes, that's nice. I'll take that. But first things first, I'm not going to rely on you. First things first, I'm going to rely on me. So I know that the job is being done. So that's um, in terms of like my family and like how we move. But in terms of the music industry, it is absolutely, the system has got to be rearranged completely, absolutely just like genres have got to go. Like that, <laughs> that is not, no, no. Like some people do not want to be only R&B. Like not every black person does R&B. Some people wanna do pop. Some people wanna do country. Some people wanna do folk. Some people wanna do EDM. Like black people are not all of those things <laughs> <laughs> exactly so then for us to turn around and have to be pigeonholed into this one this one genre is completely it's it's egregious and it's it's crazy so that's really like and then Grammys and these award shows and then you have people like when Frank Ocean was nominated for um, Urban Contemporary or he won that and you know it's like or or Tyler the Creator and he was nominated and, and won best rap album and you know that was best you know like it should it should be it should definitely not be such a definitive like oh you're black so you're r&b this is what you are because that's like if i put a mask on and i started singing you would not know you would not know who i was you would not even be able to tell so <laughs> yeah i definitely have a, a lot of opinions on that but um that's yeah <laughs> that yeah who says me too sis <laughs> Well, it's interesting you said, you know, people would not look at your family and expect you all to make the kind of music they do. Uh, one, that means they're not looking at enough Black people because I'm like, I see five beautiful people and I've heard you all perform before and you all definitely genre hop. Um, and, and as you should, right? Like it's, but you can't be what you don't see, right? So it's like, because Tina Shea got to see Janet Jackson, right? Like there's this image of somebody who looks like me, who can do all these different things, who can, you know, John Rahab, who can speak her mind. And so I can be that, right? And that people, you know, will look at you, you know, will look at her and, and have the same feeling. We'll look at you and your family and say, okay, we, we can sing Fleetwood Mac, right? And we can sing Earth, Wind and Fire. We can do all of the things because we are all the things. Um, for our visual artists on the, uh, in the conversation, I'd be curious to hear briefly, because it's our last conversation, I know we're wrapping up here. Um, can you point to someone and say, that's the sort of career that I want to have? They have been able to fulfill their potential as an artist, you know, not as a Black artist, but as an artist in the world. They have been able to create the sort of art that drives them. Um, this, this is, you know, the, the, the type of way that I would like to move in the world? Or do you feel that you have, you know, at this point in your career, perhaps you can say, oh no, I'm there. I, I, I'm very clear on what my potential is. I'm, you know, I'm on my path and I'm the guy by which I'm following. But I'd be curious to hear for you all in terms of that idea of like, can I get all that I can or all that I should of my artistic career as a black artist? Um, what does that look like for you all? We could start with, Matthew, then Christina, then Mike, then Ace. All right, sure, yeah. I think um, 
an artist in terms of potential, it takes a lot of dedication to self-reflection and seeing who you are and knowing who you are personally before you know you try to present things out to the public. And one of the people that I admire the most who've done that is Pharrell Williams, um, the way he's able to collaborate and do put his creative touch and fingerprint on any project that he does, whether it's collaboration with you know Richard Mill or working with you know uh, Sade. Um, Jay Z is another person that I admire um, his business moves as well as being in the music industry and just helping projects like Black is King to come out to really push that narrative of you know Black exceptionalism. Um, I think the onus is on the artists to really do the work on themselves first. And then out of that is a result of all the products that you created, whether it's painting, whether it's clothes, whether it's any kind of design, graphic design, whatever it may be. Um, yeah, if I'm definitely know my potential and I'm not there yet, but I like the path that I'm going on doing projects with, you know, Color of Change and, and Disney and ESPN on this project, working on this. So it's, it's, it's definitely the path and trajectory that I see myself going down. Um, yeah, and I, uh, like Matthew said, I, I believe like you, you really, really have to put in, in the work, you know, not focus so much on the barriers, but just like keep your mind um, focused on doing what's inside of you and staying true to you. Um, I definitely don't believe that I'm anywhere near my full potential, but I do know that my whole life I've had this urgency to create and to make great change and to use my work to make change. And I believe that that comes from God. And I think that when you're, when you're doing God's work and you're really staying true in your purpose, like I do believe that I will reach my full potential in, in my lifetime because of that. Thank you, Mike. Um, I think my path is like this hybrid of identity, like of my direct community of artists. Like I'm friends with, you know, Christina's partner, Al Basir Holly. He's an independent, fully independent artist, like promotes himself, sells his work himself. Like um, I art direct for Dom Kennedy. We, that's a completely independent record label that we, since the beginning, um, uh, Retina, who was a graffiti artist from LA, he's a black, half black, half El Salvadorian, but you know, prominent fine artist uh, from graffiti. Um, so, you know, I've been blessed to just, these are my peers, but these are also like, you know, examples um, that kind of just like fortify that kind of like, instead of fighting for a seat at the table, you could build your own table. <clears throat> and you know when you think of it like that like your potential could never be restrained by like the political institution of like whatever the industry is like so I don't I don't think my potential I don't find my potential binary with um politics from other people and in the politics of an industry. Um, and then it, you know, for me, it's just it's like, what do you want and why do you want it? And that that's changed for me as, you know, being a more mature artist and growing and evolving into my own personal voice. Um, and everything that I thought I wanted as a younger artist, is not really what I want. <laughs> So, um, and kind of like being a, a, able to see people go before you and see how, you know, they're getting what you thought you wanted or what is considered like to be success in their life is hell. And, you know, on the reverse side, it's like, I mean, I think there's just power and independence. Um, and yeah, I think, you know, if you, once you really like find your own voice and are comfortable within that, the answers come to you and you know which moves to make. But 
Yeah. I don't think I have anything else to say past that. Uh, I think that was perfect. What about you, Ace, to wrap up? Uh, just want to give us a word about reaching your potential as an artist. On the grand scheme, um, um, I guess I'd love to be like that, that Andy Warhol level, like that super commercially successful artist that like, and that's probably more my, my style where I, I probably won't be known for my volume of work, but I'll be known for more iconic pieces. Like to me, that's dope. Like I love Shepard Fairey because he though he does have a huge volume. He's known for like iconic work, just like, okay, I know these these few things about this person. So like those are the couple of artists that I like aspire to be. Um and uh I've reached some milestones. I think this is a milestone in itself. Like this is a pretty huge project. I think it's pretty cool that I hope a lot of people enjoy. So I hope maybe one day I tell somebody like, oh yeah, I did that uh, cover art for that. And they're like, oh no, yeah, that was a cool project. Um so that's it. As far as how where I grew up and how I grew up, like I've definitely reached it. My friends, as far as like my community, they're like, oh damn, you you've done a lot of great things in your life. So to and so in some aspect, yes, I've reached certain plateaus and milestones where I would feel like I'm successful or I've kind of made it in a way but like as far as grander greater vision I'm nowhere close and I hope to make it thank you thank you well said thank you Ace Rice thank you Mike aka God's Art thank you Matthew Dix thank you Christina Martinez thank you Momo and thank you Tina Shea this has been an amazing conversation uh and this has been another episode of Color Changes Tell Black podcast don't forget to listen to the Music for the Movement Black History Always EP streaming on Spotify, Apple Music, or on theundefeated.com. And this Black History Month, make your voice heard how you best can. Uh, find the way that you fit into the fight for freedom and liberation. Find the way that you uh, raise your voice, raise your concerns, and do it. Um, Thank you so much for joining another episode of Tell Black Stories. Please join us again wherever you stream podcasts. I'm Jamila Lemieux. Uh, have a wonderful, safe, and free Black History Month.